Yeah, welcome. I'm happy to see the full house. That's great. And I'm also happy to be here again and we've been invited again because I'm invited every year <laughs> again. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's it's nice. <laughs> and today we will be spoken the, speaking. The motto of the print day is uh, Think Print Radical or oh, Digitally. Radically Digital. Well, we've always done so at Laudert. I always like to exaggerate or ridicule things. I either ridicule the or exaggerate the motto of the print day, or do a both. And this time I thought, well, let me take the motto and think it all the way through. And I'll embark with you on this journey now. When we're speaking about uh, um, digital print and radically digital print, um, then, uh, well, let's embark on a journey through time to prepare this. I really enjoyed a lot because uh, I worked for Werk 2 for four and a half years and I was also in sales and uh, did partner management and I do not know how it actually happened. I still had the presentations dating back to that time and I thought, well, great. If you want to understand what is so digital about today's trends, you have to look at where do we come from and what are we speaking about in software terms. And I found this chart here. Can you remember? <laughs> Show of hands. Yeah, it's one, two. Yeah, uh, a, a bashful four at the back. <laughs> um, uh, this chart visualizes how database uh, database publishing systems, and those of you with the gray hairs will remember those, um, whenever you generated layouts in an automatic fashion, you talked about uh, database publishing. So what is the whole process and how has the software developed over time? You've got the stages uh, in which a publication is produced. I have to compile what I want to publish first, then I have to place it on a page, then I have some <coughs> proofreading and changes, then I do something personali personalized and then I have to export it. The first generation, so what do I need as a minimum to kick off? What is a minimum I need products? Because we're speaking about product communication here. We're at the print day and we product and uh, marketing communication europe's most uh, impactful partner uh, for um, the product and uh, um, uh, communication you you're the partner you have to control whether this is correct so originally the point was to get the bibles set by hand the big bibles to automate them in one way or the other what do i need i have to have the products first so what's supposed to be included. Then I produce new pages, then I look at the content. Well, the price has changed here, there was a misspelling there. So these are the things that uh, were done. Then um, there were some translations done and at the end you had a print file. And we're not speaking about a PDF. You had something that you could actually edit. This was really revolutionary um, and this was the first generation of systems. So first of all, getting this done. Oh, actually, learn to be a media designer at my uh, time will remember the pain. And some uh, really feel that pain even today, <laughs> as I learned yesterday. Uh, what happened next? Well, we also have completely set sentences or parts of sentences or pages uh, that we want to take over. Then um, uh, I want to not only change my price, um, and uh, well, I don't get the three products, but I would like to I would like to include the next uh, products. Then the sequence is different, so I want to have it the other way around. So this is a structural change. One thing is that I have the same objects, and there's something changing in them. And but when I actually start pushing products, then I have a structural change. And at the end of the day. Wow! In a minute, then we had uh, PDFs, uh, uh, writing color profile PDFs. Oh, this was the second generation. Then uh, we said, okay, this is all done at a desktop. Uh, we're still talking about media design here or severely afflicted. 
spirit creatures. Um, I'm allowed to say so because I used to work as one for a long, long time. Now this process is to be supported more systemically. It's great that the people have a support to sit there and do the layouts. But at the end of the day, I also want to support my planning process. So what do I do? I do whiteboarding. Ah, Horst actually had a typo in this and I really hope that it would still be included. Whiteboarding was always misspelled. And uh, Mena will remember, so, um, whiteboards mean that I optically push uh, p uh, products into the place and you don't have to say, oh, again, you could even push them somewhere one you, once you were done. And uh, also becoming possible because the software improved, I think we're at uh, 3.3, 3.4 now, was layout corrections allowing you to push elements uh, here and there and reorganize them uh, in uh, um, the uh, layout. Um, that was the third generation. And when you look at this, this is a chart that dates back to 2012, but I know that I already pre presented back in 2010. The great thing about it is that it is still true, and this is how the software really developed over time. When you look at the other issues we were confronted with, oh, what types of layouts can I automate with this? They are also one on top of each other. I spared you the animation. There's the beautiful coordinate systems. We love coordinate systems. On the one axis from top to down, there's the layout that was either standardized or is getting increasingly creative. I find it exciting that creative means the logo at the bottom. So what's desirable is at the bottom. This is how people thought back then. Today, it's completely different. And the other thing is whether this is of an informative nature. If you're a pump or a tool manufacturer or you sell technical products, then back then in the catalog, you feature, you wanted to feature and visualize the technical data above all, or whether you sell pork belly. Bon Prix um, in 2010, roughly done with the Comet at Laura that the other company I um, it was involved uh, representing Werk 2, the other side. Very hard to imagine today is that uh, creative layouts could be supported. So the text block, the image are dropped to the page and then you can work 100% creatively. The system nevertheless knows which product goes which on which page, which disruptor goes with it. So uh, to support a really creative approach. This was, uh, and I'm not joking, it was revolutionary. And this is actually part of the success of Werk 2. Um, I wanted to say we again. Um, that uh, why that's why became so successful because uh, to really support the creative part of the business was really revolutionary at that time and this is our background when you then look at uh, the current state of the art uh, this is in my office i photographed the wall uh, saw how you looked um you no know, i grayed out all of the customer names so don't you worry um but this uh, is a standard process for the coming Neowise uh, version for a layout. And I'm not going to bore you with details here. But uh, all the stages are there, but also the surrounding processes, data processes, quality processes, planning processes. They are all completely mapped these days and we're no longer supporting the desktop, but the complete area. And this is really uh, one of those standard uh, views. Those working with the current version, you can't see it here though, um, will actually see all of the stages. What's interesting about this one is that this uh, process and the stages um, nevertheless uh, actually originate from decades of um, experience from media production. So even the modern, the most up-to-date things uh, involve the expertise gained since since we started with media production. Interesting to note is that this is a process modeled in BPMN. This is a language uh, for uh, showing business processes. Horst at the bottom uses the Comunda engine uh, that actually takes these parallel processes and pr uh, runs them. Today, modeling uh, of the process is what hap what's happening technically. And the other interesting thing is um, to see the front end, uh, the content assignment. 
Today, we no longer work serially first the trousers and then the, the, the shoes. No, people work in parallel. There are translations going on, photographs are taken while translations are going on. This parallel collaboration, not first the text, then the images and then the rest. No, you actually work in parallel and then you actually decide when to go live. Ten, five or ten years ago, you had to tell people, no, really, you can dare to do that. It will work. At the end, it will work. Please do a parallel collaboration because you only need all of the things at the very end. And what's also great about it, this process um, is uh, actually run on a workflow engine. So this is fully automatic. Not only, as in the beginning, where you had fully automatic layout generation, which was pretty static, and when you had a major change, you had to regenerate. This was also fully automatic, but no, this is fully automatic. But here we have a fully automatic layout generation and a, a fully automatic process generator. And this is a wonderful thing. This is state of the art, hopefully for most of you. If not, uh, actually approach us at Loud that we do such things. Okay, where are we headed? Next question. And I found an old chart again, again by Werk 2. It also dates back to 2012. Um, 22 impulses in 21 minutes. And Horst actually jotted down um, the things uh, that will actually feature innovation over the next 10 years. So we're actually 10 years down the road. Web to print. This is on the way down. This is a commodity. Everybody wants it. This is standard uh, uh, repository. Uh, nobody's interested. It, it, has, it has to be given. This was going up today. It is a standard. Then um, things like um, digital catalogs uh, replace uh, printed catalogs. The, we have these unspeakable flip catalogs, but we have platforms like Kaufda. Um, people use apps or websites to obtain uh, of information. All of this has happened and, and uh, become true. Then this is uh, really spot on. Also uh, on demand, uh, I actually generate an on demand data sheet. And uh, when I actually have uh, compiled fittings and I want to um, order the parts for my installer, then you simply generate the complete parts list on demand. So all of these things have really come true. Personalization. I am not quite sure whether I had heard a lecture um, on uh, this year's print day that did not feature individualization or personalization. Back then it was a hot ticket and people thought, ooh, I take so much effort. And that's just a commodity today. You simply do it. This is part of the uh, normal orchestration. So cross-channel uh, networking or linking. The message is the following. All of us here, as we sit here, and uh, who have been in this industry for a while, we're all aware where we will be headed. And today I want to talk about, uh, to conclude this very long introduction, which uh, was nice as a journey to my mind, um, to cover on the areas uh, that will count for the future. What's happening now? We're not talking about chat GPT. Uh, I didn't do anything on it on LinkedIn, uh, I think, I hope <laughs> at least. And if uh, only then uh, um, it was actually uh, shameful, so to speak. Um, so uh, where are we headed? What uh, does this mean? Radically digital. Thinking radically digital. Uh, I uh, won't use this term with HS, this, this uh, carrot combination. We've heard too much about this. But I will talk about programmatic printing and I'll explain what it is. Back then, in 2008, I talked about programmatic printing with an interested party at Drupal when they wanted to have this for the biggest retail chain um, to produce 1,632 pages. They had over 80% loyalty card users, the new 
exactly what their people were buying. At the end, they didn't dare to back in 2008. And it was not very helpful to have uh, New Zealand in one of the uh, worst places you can possibly imagine for corporation, which um, there's not a single hour in which uh, somebody is not asleep or already off work. But programmatic printing, as I already said, one-on-one -on -one personalization. We're... Oh, attention. Uh, I'm also sharing this at meetings with printers. We're speaking about digital di data sources, but this does not mean that I have a database with products. I have this anyway. This has been, this is a standard. What we're talking about is the following. We're using these data sources, the data sources that are used for campaigns, for mailings, for online advertising anyway. This is all from RECO, this is from marketing automation, from uh, all of these things. Movement data, for instance. Um, I don't know. Uh, Ulrich Gorski in his lecture, is he here with us? Ulrich Gorski in his presentation a minute ago said, uh, we have recommendation at the Schaefer shop. They had a RECO for online things and used then the offline RECO uh, based on uh, 20 years of customer history could not be actually um, embedded. Um, we can do it. Schaefer shop is our customer. We can talk about it. This is possible. But these are the data sources. We're not uh, uh, saying, well, I get uh, images and text from the data source. Then a trigger comes in because we're talking about fully automatic processes. There is not a, a elderly gentleman in a beige suit sitting there um, actually embellishing the pages, the, do the double pages for weeks. No, we're speaking about a fully automatic system. There's a system, I introduce the data and everything is fully automatic. Ship it out. But this can only be achieved if the PDF is generated automatically, then I use a high-speed inject. Why? I can, I don't have to. But for Conard Electron, we do the shop cart aborters and we receive the data shortly before lunch. Then it takes a few minutes max. And then um, we actually use the digital printer and then we ship it the same night. And if I want to ship it the same night, then I need a quick, a fast printing press. And the, the quality is nice as well. And uh, when I want to do uh, 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 reduce prices, then I actually ship it uh, as dialogue post. And if um, uh, the German post says uh, if it looks different, then I can use dialogue post. And this is programmatic printing. What I do, I need it for well, shop cart aborters, but I also use it for catalog inserts. Um, um, uh, so I can actually insert a catalog with uh, personalized products. You all have the prints. You have the technology in-house anyway. You can simply do it. Then extract catalogs. I simply compile uh, products uh, on a one uh, by one basis, one to one basis, um, and package inserts. A little spoiler, package inserts are a little more difficult than you might think because if you're not an SME, um, only shipping 20 parcels, um, um, then I have automatic picking. Then I have a package or parcel line and following the sequence um, of the parcels, I have to have the technology ready and this is why you actually have to talk to us because we have the right renders for this. So I have to really look at the sequence of the parcels and I have to render and print the package insert at the right point in time. So I start restructuring my logistics line. Everybody else, uh, everybody saying this this is not true has never tried to do so. So uh, well, programmatic printing is only for uh, Amazon or author or other groups. Um, no, not true. For 12 or 15,000 euros, you can have such a thing. But if you want to do package inserts and you have more than 20 parcels a day, let's talk about it. It's not cheap, though. And data sources, I have to include something with AI. This is the buzzword. And um, if somebody actually takes a photo with me in the MacBook for me to post it on LinkedIn, great. Uh, this is, uh, I generated a stable diffusion, a robot that actually makes a product recommendation at a shop. So we're speaking about the uh, completely digital, the marketing automation. You just take what you have in your orchestration anyway. 
So if you compile all this or summarize and uh, look at the buzzwords that are being used, you have to uh, state that the whole thing is headless because there is no UI left. When I hear or receive an invitation to tender and somebody actually asks me about the UI in my pr programmatic uh, printing system, I will get a nervous background. What do you want to do with it? It's fully automatic. Nobody can tell me why they need a UI. This is ridiculous. Um, this is fully automatic. I'm used to it. I, I've been wearing it for 20 years. so <laughs> um, It's data-driven and it's fully digital. There's nothing analog going uh, apart from the printing press uh, that is uh, non-digital and the postman carrying it around. If I do, if I go for pragmatic printing, it is simply um, a, a technical implementation that you implement once. It's a touch point, and you can use it uh, like you would use uh, a banner rotation or an email or whatever. It's simply another touch point. The people actually selling printing presses don't like it too much. The print shops don't like it too much, but this is the truth. This is the remaining importance of print, which is a given though, because tactile feelings and, and value, and uh, these are values that it still can be measured and they are still important. But when researching the images for the background, um, if you don't do stable infusion, you, go, you can go for un splash and I found a photograph and I thought well that they took a photograph of this what you see here is like uh, how an e-commerce manager actually operates the recommendation engine and that was roughly around 1890 programmatic printing you have to convince the people just ones uh, who who say I don't want to spend too much money and they're the people who say I'm advertising because I want to push my bottom line. The good news is uh, if you look at print and the impact in general um, this is uh, uh, facts and figures dating back to 2020. Um, the decisive figure is uh, the conversion rates of 4 7 the conversion rates. Yeah, I share the I share the slides. I I love to share the charts. Have you taken a photograph? Oh, I told you so. Oof. No, no. The, uh, a higher conversion than online. Bigger shopping baskets. And if you remember the IBM advertising back to the 90s, for every euro we invest, we get 730. I think this is a wonderful Roy, isn't it? A beautiful Roy. This does, does this joke still work? Yes, it still works. <laughs> yes. When you look at uh, what you need for this, most people think that they need complex data structures and, uh, um, well, fact is you can already get started when you don't have any record or don't have uh, any data. Um, uh, when you know whether it's male or female customers, shoppers, even if you don't know where they live and you can only form two or three segments, makes no difference. The figures that I gave you here, this was just an excuse to show the Roy's again. <laughs> um, they refer to this. This is the same uh, 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 the study of the German post. This is not programmatic. This is just the simple thing. Uh, when with programmatic, you actually obtain over 10 euros as an ROI. It really depends on where you are, who your shoppers are, and what you do. It's not a secret. The more data I have, the more cool things I can do. That's not a secret. Um, now the custom, the 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 colleagues will provoke me. Um, the term programmatic printing is, of course, not sharply defined for most players on the market. Um, uh, programmatic means when I have a UI and when I can segment my data. But if you really want to do the layouts one on one and personalize and select articles one on one and then actually enhance them with remaining stocks or whatever. Cluster mailings are somewhere in the, the middle. This is not programmatic printing t for us, in our opinion. Hyper-personalization, again, 
we're alone when when it comes to the degree of personalization but uh, programmatic printing is uh, given when i have it fully automatic fully personalized and headless 100 percent headless there is an FTP uh, file where I introduce or save my customer data and the products they should get. This is programmatic printing, so headless, data-driven, and fully automatic. And since so many people know about it, and uh, many have heard this term but don't know what it means, we actually established the Pro Programmatic Print Alliance last year. The 22nd of May, it went online louder. It actually has the member number number one. But there are over 20 companies' uh, members now, all of the competitors, and we cooperatively work towards educating people about programmatic printing and why you should do this is no longer Nokia uh, cell phones and beige suits it is a fully digital touch point and what does it look like in detail on the left hand side we have a catalog or a mailing is it is it the catalog insert or the 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 mailing uh, Christoph it's the mailing and you can't see it well but in a fully dynamic engine, uh, p products are placed uh, uh, with fillers, uh, fully personalized, loyalty bonus. This is implemented and a given. But the most important thing is that both mo the uh, next best offers and uh, product recommendations are included. In the travel market, this is quite interesting. This is for Nico Cruises, an upselling mailing. So people who have already booked a cruise with Nico Cruises will get uh, offers well, g g by the uh, beverage package. This is a nice excursion for you. I'll do it with the mouse cursor. This is the river course here, vertical, here, horizontal, or images that uh, um, uh, in, are in spaces, then the offers are different. If I only have three offers here and then have used up all of the fillers, then I use ambience images that I can uh, use to enrich. This has been predefined and it is done automatically or uh, on the left-hand side, when I have tables tables that are not high enough, this is automatically identified and then the space is filled up with, with image Im uh, images, for instance. This is a self-mailer and then um, I have in, in line with the cruise and since I know when the person will be traveling and where, I have weather data. So what is uh, uh, the weather like uh, when this person actually travels? And this is all done fully automatically and no witchcraft. We talked about this for a few weeks and it was done. This was cheaper than many, many other standard projects. But uh, you didn't have to discuss uh, so long about who presses what, when, where. Uh, who knows what a horstogram is? Do you want to explain what it is? A horstogram? Or horstograph. This is a term I coined for a specific type of uh, diagrams that Horst Huber always included in his presentation. The horstogram actually features a complex uh, um, fact, uh, and it is correct. That's the second feature. Uh, yes, and it is also pretty complete. And this is the third characteristic, and the fourth uh, characteristic. That is, and since it is that way, the eye slides off. This is also a horstogram. Although it wasn't done by a horse, to, uh, we did it, I think. I think Christopher did it, yes. <laughs> um, this is what a horse scrum is all about. On the one hand side, I've got my article data in the known systems that you use for, for other things. On the other hand, I've got the uh, shopper data or customer data. This can be the ERP system, the recommendation engine. It can be customer programs, automation, everything you have and various uh, recommendations are generated which can then be exported and then y you actually compile everything and uh, you end up with a PDF. Poof! PDF, this is the process in the middle. And this is uh, what is currently, what we're very successful with on the market. Is it digital? Is it fast? Is it, does it export? Can it be exported for the online channel? Yes, it does. But when you want to go beyond, what are the trends? Well, 
how shall I describe it and sort it best? And I said, well, let's look ahead of time. What can we do in the future? And we said, uh, we will decide what is to be included in all of this. When I have a brochure or catalog um, and uh, do it classically, um, I'm looking at my watch here, then uh, today this is often still done manually. But uh, um, they say, well, we've always done it that way. Why aren't you saying, well, this plan um, should be a programmatic one. I'll take products that I currently have with the highest margin or um, since I run a campaign on uh, uh, saunas uh, because I'm a DIY store, I'll actually s select them by the importance of segment or when, I, or when I'm a food retailer. I'll do a little campaign with things that I need to sell quickly because of the expiry dates. Or I have uh, uh, inventory left that I want to sell out. And this is often uh, following a gut feeling. This is true. But the question is, why don't you use criteria to plan it? I have this great product data. So whether it goes for AI or reconfiguration programs or whatever, or lay down a number of business policies or rules, this can be automated, this choice or this selection. And when you then look at the pages and how they're planned, what are the segments in my pages and which products will be placed in the individual areas, the boxes. Again, I really want to generate the pages uh, based on grids. This is there are just two constraints uh, to this because I have to look at the sizes of the grids and which products do I want do I want to feature. This can be planned programmatically. You don't have to have people sitting there and doing all nighters for manual planning. This is so twentieth century. This can be done programmatically. The pre planning can be done. I'm not speaking about replacing the competence and the expertise. No, we're just helping people in their work to do the pre-planning, knowing beforehand, uh, stay with the Schaefer shop, I have furniture and some workshop uh, um, supplies, and this is included in my database, well, uh, lay down the criteria and then have the system do it automatically. This is what's going to be the future. In summary, they said, ideas that uh, people in charge of marketing will first hate, but later love. It sounds radical, but the way we said in the past, wouldn't it be great to have a creative process supported by such a, an automatic system? It's the same thing. It's technically absolutely feasible. It saves so much work, but you simply have to do it to go for it. Uh, proofreading cycles. This is a uh, um, uh, chart going back to 2014 by Werk 2 and Horst asked, um, which uh, uh, proofreading cycles do you have? Back then in 2014, um, a customer whose name I won't uh, uh, actually release um, didn't do any correction cycles or proofreading cycles any longer. Uh, you can save up to 50% of the time when you go digital. They started it, they turned their shitty process into a shitty digital process and didn't save any time. Strange. And then Horst said, because the product managers started thinking what they wanted to have once they saw the uh, uh, the set page. Optimal process. And host said, it's very easy. I will tell you right away how to save 50% of the time. The minute uh, you've actually submitted the page, you won't see this page again until it's printed. And then you will start thinking beforehand. In 2013, this is what he said. It's 23 now. 10 years down the road. And I still... Uh, see when I consult customers uh, um, who decides when until when because in food retail many changes are needed and I still hear no this is not possible yes it already worked 10 years ago at times you simply want to ask what's wrong with you 
why are people are sticking to the old things? We're not talking about uh, uh, replacing expertise. We're simply uh, speaking about augmenting the expertise to, to speed up processes. And I love to compare this with the automotive industry at this point. In the 70s or 80s, people actually uh, stood along the assembly line in uh, for Ford in Colonial. Nobody does this anymore. Nobody assembles cars uh, manually. There's still people left uh, to take decisions along the assembly line. It, this is the truth. A catalog generation process is an industrial process. And at the end, you've got a result, like at an assembly line. This is where we're headed. And uh, if you like to work on these things, let us know. We also have a stand at the back of the hall. And when you look at the future, then um, the consultant uh, um, find it easy, but it's the truth. What you do in terms of supported automation, uh, automation can also um, be used for the automation of your assembly line, in inverted commas. When I have mechanisms to do the planning, to support the planning and the um, the uh, layout distribution, then I've also reached the point in time I'll use it backwards. I have this merchandise and now I do an A-B test uh, and just using the pre-planning, fully automatic, and I only go for the fast uh, selling products, fast moving products, and then I, I just go for the um, uh, high margin products. Gut feeling is fine, but there are figures available. And once you have it, you can actually fully automatically uh, push these products. What I use at the front end can also be used retrospectively uh, backwards so to speak. And that's the nice thing. Then I get this feedback cycle. When I have uh, s uh, somebody who de uh, decides based on sales successes of the past and then look at the end, which ones are successful of these campaigns and then actually feed back the insights. You want to have it in your marketing automation? You're not serving a very important channel, and I, I am supposing this. You can correct me uh, if I'm wrong, but I suppose that you're not using, using this marketing opportunity. Then you can use these insights, bring them forward, and save them. You get this feedback loop, and you have a self-optimizing system without uh, chat GPT and the apocalypse of the world. In summary, we have uh, turned, come full circle, 360 degrees. We started with fully automatic process, allowed some manual interferences, and are back with fully automatic processing. Today, it is uh, uh, about uh, print having to prove its impact. Timed again, um, back then, um, I also thought when print was done without a reflection on its impact, it's, 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 it was not okay. Today, it has to do the same thing. We've really come full circle, 100%, and uh, we're supporting the whole process now. And there's not somebody left sitting at the uh, um, computer doing the layout. When you look at the types of different supports you've got today, or the types of integration, then um, print used to be the endpoint of all of the data collection. Uh, you only created a PIMOL dam system to do print, because otherwise you wouldn't have had the data. It's different today. Today, print is just one uh, part of a big chain a trigger chain and it's integrated so it must become more and more efficient but the good news is if you uh, uh, use VACT SPY technology, then you've got the toolkit available. And there's so many nice uh, service providers like Laudert who uh, simply like to consult. We do not actually have to do everything we can. We also come in to consult you and have an eye on your processes. Uh, it's no longer 2012. You no longer have to guess, do guesswork or do anything manually. Thank you. Well, if I have understood the agenda correctly, then we've got two minutes left for questions. Well, yeah, uh, be brave. I can stand it. I'll stay around. If you say coffee is better, then uh, you can have a coffee. Yes, please. Uh, 
which point of the programmatic printing when you actually install it is the most difficult one to dare to do it? The question was, which part of programmatic printing is the most difficult one? And the answer reads that people not only find it cool, but really do it. No, no, I thought about the installation. Is it more in shipping or in compilation or in pre uh, printing? Uh, is it horrible when I say it's not difficult at all? Because you have it anyway. You need a CSV with the address data and the CSV with the product data. The worst case. And rough idea what you want this to look like. But we also have a creative unit called Loft uh, to consult you. But I need two CSV with the uh, product numbers one and with the um, uh, receivers and uh, the policies. Christoph. Maybe I can answer this. The most difficult point to my mind is when you actually involve a creative agency. Because they say, yeah, we have to take a closer look at it. And automatic, oh no, the layout will be boring. This is all structures and standardized. No, that's boring. And when a creative agency then actually is to lay down rules uh, for the layout, uh, which uh, and they are unaware of the, the automation rules, then reconciliation will become difficult. Uh, Torsten uh, presented a wonderful example. After we said, um, get the or dismiss the creative agency, we can be just as creative for the sound very good objection uh, and for the recording to for the records Christoph clearly said one big obstacle is the creative agencies because the creative agencies are used to interfere with the layout down to the last of detail and often lack the competence to develop uh, um, dynamic layouts it doesn't mean this is the offer here, I have this and there. I have a box and the um, I actually break it down for the number of offers and not always the small one to the left, but the right one to the, to the big one to the right. It's rules based and creative agencies who are not familiar with this um, cannot uh, think outside the box. I think that, that was a nice joke. <laughs> That's pretty befitting. This is often the problem. So control is possible, but it's it's rules based. But they can be very granular, last to the, the smallest of details, and it does not require seventy man days uh, uh, to do. Andreas Hengsbach has a, um, a thoughtful uh, view. Uh, yeah, c come up with the question. This is exactly what I'm thinking about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, no, if nobody else has a question, then you're actually released to have coffee. Thank you.